Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar discussing the didactics of students playing the role of teachers, of researchers. <laughs> this event is part of the Accelerate Your Teaching MOOC, Research Facilities to Support STEM Education. My name is Miriam Molina and together with my colleagues Mijalina Partiga and Diego Fernandez, we would like to thank you for joining us today. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, please make sure that your sound is turned on, and we would like to remind you that during this webinar, your cameras and microphones are off. Secondly, if you have any questions, you are invited to write them here in the chat, and we will address them in the end. This webinar is recorded, and we will publish it in the course so you can watch it again. And you will also have access to all the slides and links shared during this webinar. And now I would like to welcome our speakers. Today with us, we have Christian Anderson and Jesper Brum. Christian has a teaching degree uh, as well as a master's degree in theoretical physics. Uh, during his time as upper secondary school teacher in physics and mathematics, he worked in uh, many projects to connect learning and science curricula to the local community. And this included uh, having students collect data, draw conclusions and report to the public, local authorities, stakeholders and decision makers. Currently, he is working at Malmo University and in parallel with teacher education and towards a PhD in uh, didactics of the natural sciences and mathematics. The focus of uh, his research is how big data analytics, artificial intelligence and machine learning may reframe discussions on democracy and societal, uh, societal stability in classrooms. Now we also have Jesper who works at the Department of Science Education at the University of Copenhagen. He has a background in physics from the Niels Bohr Institute and his PhD and academic work in uh, physics education research. Now in his research, he develops and tests new teaching formats and use network analysis to investigate teaching and learnings in physics. So now without further ado, I would like to first pass the floor to Christian. Christian, the floor is yours. Christian, I think we are unmuted. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, Miriam. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think you can hear me now, right? Yes. Perfect. So uh, I hope that many of the participants had the opportunity to have a look at the um, at the research paper about SSI that we have in the MOOC. That research paper talks about SSI social scientific issues as something that is useful for teachers because uh, it, it is a effective method in, uh, for teachers to, to get students to learn more. Uh, but it doesn't really explain what social scientific issues are. So I will provide three examples of uh, social scientific issues projects uh, that I have been a part of. Um, so especially the first one uh, I was um, during my time as a teacher and the other two are research papers that I have been reading and studying. There is, by the way, a lot of research papers about social scientific issues. So if you're interested in the topic, you can just Google and find more examples of how you can teach in relation to this. Uh, so the first example is the beaches of Malmö. So this is the local city where I'm living and where I worked as a teacher. Uh, so the municipality cleans the beaches. So as you can see in the picture, the beaches are lovely, but there also are some dead seaweed on it. So the municipality removes that uh, both on the shore and beneath the surface, and that have an impact on biodiversity because fish need the seaweed to hide in and to hatch eggs and so on. So social scientific issues are typically about a real issue in the society that doesn't necessarily have a clear cut solution that everyone can agree upon. So it's typically an ethical dilemma of a sort, different stakeholders and opinions. So in this case, it's either protecting biodiversity or having pretty beaches. Um, this project was uh, in collaboration with a local research institute called CU. And by the way, I won't read out everything on my slides, but you will be able to find the slides later on the MOOC. So uh, the biologists have hypothesized that the, the cleaning will have an impact on biodiversity, but they didn't have the time to explore to what extent it will have an impact. 
So that uh, created an opportunity for students. So what the students did was that they uh, carried out an examination of this. So they, they collected data from the beaches, looking both at the places where cleaning had been done and not done uh, and, and compared. And when you compare in science and you have a control and test group, you have to do some statistics in order to see whether or not there is a real difference or if it's just randomness. So they practiced the scientific method during this project. And they presented their results at a local science center in Malmö uh, that was open to the public. So when they did that poster exhibition, they presented their results and the researchers came there very curious about the findings. Uh, teachers and parents, of course, came too, but also the general public. So they, the students, held that exhibition in the role of experts. They knew more than anyone else about this. Uh, so that, of course, built some, some confidence and, and proudness among the students. I should add here also uh, that as a teacher, it takes some time to, to, um, to prepare such a project. And uh, many of these projects are also scalable. So we did it in two classes in parallel. That meant that we were two teachers, meaning that we could uh, we had more teacher preparation time. So it was pretty much uh, the preparation time per teacher was cut in half because we were two teachers in this. The other example uh, is from Cyprus. It's uh, the pig farm. This was uh, a local issue on Cyprus. So uh, there was this village that had an intense debate whether or not to move a local pig farm or not. Uh, of course, the pig farm provided uh, some economical wealth to the local community, but it also smelled a lot. So there was this debate about what, what to do. Uh, this was for younger kids, aged 10 to 12. And since it was for younger kids, uh, the teachers uh, spent some time uh, discussing argumentation. What is an argument? What is a counter argument? What is a scientific fact? Uh, they also spent a lot of time in introducing the problem for the students and learning them uh, how to use devices that could gauge the water quality at the farm. But eventually the students went to the farm, interviewed the farmer, made measurements, and uh, their results, their, their findings, conclusions, was uh, discussed in, back in the classroom. And finally, the students wrote a letter to the local authorities uh, saying what the students thought that needed to be done about the farm, whether or not to move it. This project was in the, underpinned by the idea that, um, that students reason better if they can connect to, to the, uh, the, the content. Uh, if they have personal knowledge about what we're discussing in the classroom, they might reason better. Because sometimes in, in a classroom, the discussion can be very theoretical about things that students not, doesn't necessarily can relate to. But the pig farm was very concrete, something that was close to where the students lived, so they could relate to it. What happened in this project was also that the arguments uh, that the students made uh, had sort of two dimensions. So both they had scientific arguments because they could measure the water quality, but there were also arguments of a more of an ethical type. So you have both scientific facts and ethical values uh, being part in the discussion. And those two sort of mingles in, in the final conclusions that are also typical of social scientific issues. So science can be a part of the discussion, but it doesn't necessarily is sufficient to arrive at the conclusion because there are uh, other values at stake here, like fairness. We cannot just move the farmer, it's his farm, for instance. Uh, another thing that also appeared in this uh, particular project was that it's not only about scientific facts and, and ethics, it's also about subjective experiences. So what happened? when the students visited the farm, it was that many students, when they felt the smell, uh, they changed their opinion. Uh, so it's about such things too. Uh, final example is from the United States. Uh, the urban heat island effect is something that happens in big cities where you have less trees and, and greeneries in the city center, then the city centers become a bit hotter than the rest, and this is a problem. This is also a problem in European cities. 
So here we had also younger kids, 10 to 14 year olds living downtown. Uh, and this was part of an um, after school activity club that was sort of semi mandatory to the students. And their role was to create a documentary about this effect. So they were supposed to investigate is there an urban heat island effect in this city? And if so, prove that and make a documentary about it. So they, of course, made measurements, collected data, made graphs and, and, and draw conclusions. But it was also part of this project to communicate the science, not only producing the science. So one issue for them, for instance, was to be clear about the differences between global warming that everyone knows about and the local warming effect that this was about. Um, also, these students realized when they interview people on the street that, hey, wait, we're the experts here. We know more than the general public uh, about this effect because they had done the measurements. They, they understood the, the physics here. So that helped them to build a, um, a science identity that isn't very common among these segments of the population because these were unprivileged students living in downtown areas impoverished areas uh, and it also helped developing agency among the students they could see that this is something that we can do something about this is something that we want to do something about so it provided more than just knowledge some general observations here across the uh, the uh, examples so i'm seeing that if you have relatable content in your projects something that students can relate to, it, it, it's important. It makes them engage with the content more. Also giving them the role of an expert can be highly motivating, especially if they could acquire some unique knowledge that no one else knows about, that makes them feel and actually be experts. Uh, the local situation can be a resource for you as a teacher to draw from to, to create that authenticity and uniqueness that a product like this can, can benefit from. But then there is also the case of what to do with the results. So in some cases, you might have authorities that are listening to students, but you cannot count on that as, as the, the standard. So sometimes uh, you might wish for politicians to listen to students, but they don't. But regardless of whether they do that or not, um, it's more important for, from a teacher and learning perspective, perhaps, to illustrate for the students how science matters in a decision making process. So in the case with the pig farm, when they wrote that letter, they didn't know whether or not the politicians would read it or not, or if they would, would take action according to the suggestions that the students made. But in the process of writing that letter, the students didn't know that, so it felt real enough. They know that potentially this letter could have an impact. So the, the decision, the knowledge that the students had could potentially have an impact on society. Finally, uh, the format of, of the final presentations in such projects seems to me to be important for formatting the entire experience for students. If you know from the start that you will write that, uh, letter to the authorities, then that sort of formats your entire experience of the project. But as you know, this is a MOOC about accelerating uh, your teaching and particle accelerators. So these three examples was not about accelerators. Hopefully they gave some idea about what social scientific issues projects can be. But what we need to explore in the MOOC is how to create learning scenarios about accelerators. So I, I, I end my presentation with a question. Um, how do we utilize any of these uh, findings, uh, observations for creating learning scenarios based on uh, related to accelerators? And and so uh, this is uh, where I am uh, to jump in, not with a solution, <laughs> but uh, but hopefully with 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 some 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 added uh, uh, questions or 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 maybe some some uh, some insights. And and what I saw in each of the three examples is I see um, two two things that I think 
could be problematic in terms of accelerator physics, um, but could also maybe be turned to something uh, uh, something great. One thing is um, this real life urgency. In each of the three examples, I see some kind of uh, something that is relevant to the students in their local setting. Um, but also, I actually saw something else which I hadn't seen before, which is uh, uh, there is always a sensory experience. So being on the pig farm, that's the sort of most uh, uh, um, uh, the, the one that sort of stands out the most. But but also the urban heat. Well, you, you can feel the heat uh, uh, when you're in the uh, uh, um, on the beach. You will have you know the smell of beach and, and being on the on the beach. And my question would be, or what what we could discuss is how how would we how would we get such such an urgency and and could we get a sensory experience um, in 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 uh, in uh, in teaching with accelerators um, to produce something like these uh, social scientific issues? Yes, I've been thinking about that. I mean, one challenge is that you have these big accelerators, these huge facilities like in Geneva, CERN, and you have one big in Lund, Sweden, but they're not very common. So it's not, not like you have an accelerator uh, next door. So it's not possible to really relate it to like the local situation as a teacher. But we have digital resources too. So some facilities offer some, some uh, virtual tours of, of the accelerator. I think some facilities also have data accessible through the internet that you can look at. I think CERN have that with some, some particle uh, reactions that you can look at and study. Um, but for the urgency though, um, maybe you could go to like smaller accelerators. So in most cities you will have a hospital and, and you will have a lot of accelerators uh, in the hospital as part of the machinery to to investigate bodies and, and look into bodies, what's what's so to detect diseases and, and cancer and whatnot. And those are in many cases accelerators. And um, one social scientific issue might be, for instance, let's say that you have this hospital. Will they invest in a big new machine for 10 millions of euros or will they hire two more uh, doctors, for instance? So that is a choice you can do. You have a limited amount of money. Um, that choice will have an impact uh, and it needs to be made now uh, because the technology is, is, is for sale. So maybe accessing uh, what's what's not local through the internet and digital resources and also looking for like your local particle accelerators and relate that to society. Yeah. And another thing I was wondering is okay, the the final one had some some physics content, um, but is it sparse with physics content for these uh, social scientific issues, or is it uh, always with with some some so, sort of interdisciplinary or or? Um... Mm -hmm. I don't have any data, but my feeling is that it's it's often transdisciplinary. Uh, and, and related to like social, economical, and ecological sustainability. Having pure physics or only physics, uh, I, I can't think of any examples. I, you might be able to do that. Uh, do you know any? Um, I was thinking so uh, uh, in some of the uh, teaching programs that I'm teaching, we. Uh, we we also experiment with with uh, our students doing social scientific issues. Um, last year there was a course um, where we they they uh, one of the we we had a, a theme about space, and so what they did was they had had a um, a, a learning scenario which was about uh, garbage in space because that is actually becoming an increasing problem now. Uh, that uh, that that and then I think they used. Um, basically a large room at the school and then sort of hung down uh, uh, things that represented garbage and then students should uh, kind of kind of navigate but, but also begin to sort of say something like okay how probable is it that if i'm a spaceship or a, a, 
uh, something else, a, a person in space uh, on a space station. How probable is it that I, am, I will uh, become hit by by garbage, or I will hit garbage? That's also a possibility. So, so you could do something like that. I'm guessing that that you could also, I mean. Uh, um, if you talk to, uh, hopefully on this course, you will learn about how accelerators work. And and I'm guessing that you could also try and say, okay, what is it actually, how does such an accelerator look? And and what, I mean, uh, why is it that they are so big and why do we need them? Yeah. Um, and you could have, you could have the students discuss that. And you could also, based on such discussion, have them write um, a letter to to uh, a, a government saying we need this or we don't need this, and why is that? Yeah, exactly. We have some wonderful scientist stories in and and the MOOC that might be interesting in relation to this issue. Yeah, so uh, so go explore those, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great advice. Um, we're also wondering, well, uh, maybe some teachers are also thinking, um, what can I expect when I introduce this approach for the first time in my classroom? Because what if my students are just used to, you know, go to class, uh, be there and, you know, kind of be a passive learning instead of uh, being uh, at the center? Because this is a huge, a huge change. What do you think? Uh, how do you think students will react if a teacher proposed this for the first time? That is a challenge. <laughs> so uh, I would advise teachers to, if they do this for the first time, don't push it too much to so do a small experiment that might have part uh, partly lessons uh, traditional lessons also connected to it so so it's a learning process for the students not only learning the content but also learning the, the form of this kind of teaching yeah we have to acknowledge that that students are are used to a different kind of teaching and that's basically globally that they are used to that um so it that you can expect some pushback you can even expect the pushback from 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 very involved parents. Um, so my I would suggest that you you find a topic where you where um, you think this is actually really important that they they learn this and that they actually are, are are capable of making a decision because social scientific issues is also about decision making and and taking a stance. And if you have that idea as a teacher. Um, I think it's a, a then 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 choose your subject and then say okay this is where we do it if if that is the case however there's also times where you get a class of students where the traditional teaching simply doesn't work and then you're sort of free <laughs> to try and do what what you have to. I've also been in that situation so um as teachers you all know how to read your classroom so you probably know okay should I just go full on with this um, or should I maybe maybe try it once uh, once in a while and see if I can get them used to something? Maybe uh, have it be part of a more traditional lesson, then then have a a little bit of it at the end or at, uh, in the middle or something like that. So you you try it out a little bit. Thanks a lot. This makes a lot of sense. I think it's very useful for teachers. Uh, thanks a lot also, Christian, for your presentation. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. We're seeing also in the chat. Uh, thanks, Anna, for your comment. Thank you. All right. So if you want, maybe perhaps we can move on to our second presentation. Jesper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about uh, what I call productive failures, uh, narratives and, and a notion of alibi. And I'll talk about what that is. Um, and, and this is an approach to uh, inquiry based science education. So social scientific issues and inquiry based science education is not exactly the same, but they do share uh, some things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll just give you a short reminder about what is an inquiry based science education. Uh, I, I think that a lot of you have maybe heard of it or have taken courses about it, but just so we know, we're, we're sort of on the same page. But then I also talk about some of the problems that happen, and we sort of touched about touched on that uh, uh, just before, but some of the problems that might um, happen when IBSC or inquiry-based science education meets what I call the life world of students. Um, and then I'll talk about narratives as a possible solution to 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 this. I call it a paradox. So let's start with the inquiry based science education. And 
here you can see this is one of the very used models. You have a, a phase where you engage the students, then they are set to explore something. They explain or are explained to. That's a, a double edge uh, thing here. And then you can elaborate and center to all of it is this is called evaluate, but it can be both formative assessment and, and summative assessment. So, so this is central also to, to all the phases. As a teacher, you always evaluate where the students are. And this is taken from NASA, but there, there are so many clip, so many more uh, versions of this model. Um, I think the main takeaway from this is that you have to have meaningful and challenging tasks for students to explore before explanations are constructed or given. And that is the real challenge uh, because uh, it's not in, in this kind of teaching, you sort of give them just enough to get started and then when they have questions you know that these questions are something they actually want to to get answered so so you can help them as a teacher and it works however um and this relates exactly to what uh, we talked about before um sometimes students they prefer to be passive and this is actually not from high school this is from first year college students uh, it is uh, a, a, at a well-known American university, and it's uh, in a course in physics in the subject subject of statics. They did it in another course as well, but but here I just the pattern was the same. And they did one lesson or lecture, as they call it, where one was uh, passive, that was where you have this more traditional style, and then one which was active, which actually followed this inquiry structure. And then if you uh, uh, look at what the students said, so they they gave them a survey. Uh, and they said level of agreement out here. So five, you agree a lot and one, you do not agree. And then you, you, if you look at it, it's it's sort of depressing from the sense of, of uh, inquiry based science education because they enjoyed the passive lecture more. They felt like they learned more. The instructor was more effective. And I wish all my physics courses were taught this way. They, they, they uh, like the passive more than they like the active. Um, but then they also, this is from this study, and you can you can access it yourself if you want to. But then they also tested learning, and they did that in the same way in the two in the two courses. So it was it was uh, as controlled as we can do it in 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 science education. And as you can see here, they in the active they actually learned more. So so even though they learn more by by this meaningful activation, they sometimes prefer to be passive. And so. Here's a mystery uh, uh, graph. I'll, I'll get get to it. It's a mistake from my part that it's not hidden right now. So ignore it for now. Um, there was a question from uh, uh, in Denmark in 2015 to Danish high school students, and they asked this question on a on a survey uh, uh, on a survey that was uh, longer. But but I, I I took this question because I think it had uh, an interesting uh, answer. Have you ever refrained from raising your hand out of fear? And this is supposed in the classroom when teaching happens. 85% of the of the sample students, they answered yes. Um, and so here, here is then how often do you refrain from raising your hand again out of fear? And uh, this is for the 5,615 students who actually uh, uh, answered uh, yes. Um, so 10%, they say every lesson, a little bit more than 10%, more than 30% say every day, more about 30% say every week and so on. So, so, so you have that more than 70% actually on a weekly basis are afraid for, of, of participating, of doing stuff in school. Um, there is a caveat because this is Danish high school students asking Danish high school students. There's also a slight over representations uh, over representation of females in in this uh, um, uh, of young women in in this uh, in this sample here but i think the signal is quite strong um and it does tell us something about that 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 our students might actually be a little bit afraid to participate now imagine that i go from not only raising my hand and trying to say what i think the teacher wants me to do but actually being 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 challenged by something that is quite hard um, that can be that can lead to people uh, wanting to uh, maybe not engage as much as much. So so here's my problem uh, so summed up. Uh, so the IBSC strategies when you use them right, they are very effective. 
but many students prefer traditional lecture first approaches. So if you if they don't want it, then it's going to be difficult, right? So IBSC works, but it doesn't work uh, in the sense that that uh, um, that we have these these problems for students sometimes. So a possible reason is 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 a fear of failure. And so we wanted to investigate whether we could do something about this. Um, um, just to uh, be clear, this this fear, I have to say that um, uh, about uh, five, six hundred of them, they also answered, why are you afraid? And a lot of them answered the teacher, but even more answered the other students or they, they actually called it social anxiety. So there's, it's not only you, it's not only the teacher, it's also the other students. Um, so we we investigated, could we say that narrative scenarios, as I will explain a little bit about, could that be part of the solution? Could you could you somehow uh, have the students uh, play a little bit? And then then it's a, it's part of the solution. So it's this is actually used in medical education. So narrative scenarios, they simulate plausible cases. And through these scenarios, educators compel students to intervene in a simulated environment where each intervention creates consequences that prompt further action. So there is sort of a progression in these narrative scenarios. There is a, 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 a pedagogical researcher who, and this is quite old, but it's still good, uh, who is Singer, who, who had the idea of a magic circle. And, and basically we live in, in sort of a world, but then we can sometimes enter, uh, and that's what children do when they play, they enter a magic circle where the rules are different. So we are in a classroom world uh, usually, but now, and that's where we can fear stuff. So, so our our plan was to sort of lure the students into the magic circle where it's okay to say things that are are sort of uh, ridiculous or or wrong even. So, as an example, um, we did a project uh, in Denmark, and it's in Danish. You're welcome to go to the uh, web page that's in the in the links. So, if you have some kind of working uh, uh, Danish vocabulary, that would be meaningful. Otherwise, good luck. But I'll tell you a little bit about it. So the Mars base is 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 a where well, we develop teaching materials for basic high school level physics course in Denmark. So our idea was to cover the whole thing. Um, and the idea now is that students must buy into that they are pioneers on Mars sometime in the future. So already now we are trying to remove them from from the setting of the classroom. And 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 as pioneers on Mars, they are now faced with various problems. And and it is through solving these problems that they are to learn the physics. And we have planned the teaching to be inquiry based. Um, we we also have some 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 uh, tested a number of lessons and lessons, and we have recorded the uh, students' uh, discussions. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, this is how it looks when you are a student uh, looking at the, the. So there's a a, a problem text that you can see here. Basically, what it says is that we want you to give you give us your vision for the base, but the base can only produce, uh, uh, I think it's uh, 40 kilowatts. And, and the systems, if you turn on all the systems, they're gonna use more. So as an example, we have these first year high school students, you can see the age here, and they are engaged in this mission that's, that's called the energy systems of the base. They're trying to discuss what are the subsystems we need to, to use, when do they need to be on and so on. And so we jump into their, their discussion. We have student A saying, so is heat essential? <laughs> Well, on Mars, it's quite warm, isn't it? Actually, it's further from the sun, isn't it? It's further from the sun? Yeah. Isn't it closer? Nope. Oh, um, and they don't have an atmosphere. Um, ventilation, that's also quite important, right? Yes, ventilation, yes. Um, what about light? It's not necessary, at least not at night. Not at night, no. Okay, so we say we exclude light from, 40, uh, from 24 to 6 from midnight to six o'clock. That might be, and then we don't know what she's saying. Mm, yes, it's it's pretty annoying though, if you have to go to the toilet. And then student C, who we haven't heard from before, laughs. Yes, but then we could we, we could have some flashlights. Yeah, that's a good idea. We have flash, flashlights with us on Mars. So here comes something that I have highlighted. So when does the sun set? That's the question. Is, is there sun on Mars? Does it shine the same way as it does on Earth? Because if there's no atmosphere, how can it? And now we, we leave the discussion. So I've highlighted those two questions because in a roundabout way, they actually arrive 
by being a little bit silly, they arrive at some very nice scientific questions because actually the sun does not look or behave the same on Mars as it does on Earth because the atmosphere it's there, but it's different. So there are some differences there. Um, and it, it would it would not uh, uh, rise and set in the same manner uh, as on Earth. So, so students A and B, they actually use the narrative. They go into the narrative and imagine we are on Mars and they use it to ask a good, actually good scientific question, if you ask me. So they are in the magic circle. We don't know about the student C uh, from this excerpt. We cannot know if, if student C is in this or, or not. Uh, so we know, uh, I know from later on that the, stu the uh, student C might actually be more out in, in the classroom world and not engaging in the story, but that's a different uh, topic. So this uh, leads me to the notion of alibi. So when students are in the magic circle, it's okay to say things or, or, and do things that you don't normally say or do, such as being wrong. Um, the story and their role in the story can now be used, as I call it, as an alibi. It's okay that I'm doing this because it wasn't me that said the wrong thing. It was the role. This needs to be when they buy into the story. Also, they we hear from the, from the students that some of the observable of phenomena on Mars may be different on Earth. So that gives them also some leeway. So that so just removing them from, from the normal setting of the classroom where everything they perceive, at least where everything is given, there's always a correct answer to everything. Now it's a little bit more uh, uh, fuzzy and now they can they feel they can they can provide something. And the teacher also has a role in facilitating the narrative. So it worked best in our case when the teacher actually took on the role as in our case mission control and was not exactly the teacher when they did the game, but actually just asked them uh, uh, questions and, and then took on the role as, as sort of a mission command or something like that. And that is what I had to say. You have the links and references here that I have used um, with, with some yeah uh, links and so on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question about the medical circle because what I'm hearing from your presentation is that there are sort of three things here so you have the you have the students playing a role right and then you have the the resources the the sort of external material uh, so uh, the the mars base website and that could be something else in another project but but some resources and 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 those help the students in in, in entering the medical circle to to sort of buy into the role but you mentioned also that the teacher play a role here, and I suppose in, in all re uh, projects like this, we have to play a role to some extent, at least to the fact that we, we do not disclose everything we know from the start, because the, the point is that the students explore. But you also mentioned that that the, the teacher in this case played a, a role. So can you say something more about the role of the teacher in the process of making students buy into such scenarios? like? What are the do's and don'ts for a teacher? Could, let's say that you have excellent uh, teaching material that could help the students opt in. Could the teacher mess that up in some way? <laughs> I would rather say, I think the teacher um, could, could, could do a, a lot by saying, well, um, I'm, not, I'm not assessing you now. Uh, now I I'm I am just be explicit about being I am now in the role of maybe uh, uh, the chief scientist on Mars or in this in this particular case um, that 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 would be something that I think the the, the 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 teacher could do because oftentimes when when you are a teacher you can get into a position where I have all the answers yeah. but if you let that go and say I actually I actually don't have all the answers here and. and uh, we there are not. It's not that there are, are no correct answers, but there are maybe answers that are better, also uh, from a physical point of view, than others. If you are making a vision for Mars, well, you can you can argue for your vision in a in a uh, using physics, um, and that would be uh, 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 some strong arguments. I would I would say coming from physics, of course. Um, but you could also argue from other points of view, but but uh, um, which are, are, are non scientific. Um, so 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 giving them the the freedom so as a, as a teacher i would say give the students the freedom to to uh, uh, yeah yeah to to take on the roles and and when they do then then encourage that so if you see okay now you're taking on the role and then 
then you can actually maybe play a little play the role a little bit more and 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 let's say that that what they're handing in is for for a third party then you can say okay we need to convince these people to do this kind of like what what you did in in the three examples you had it was always there was a third party which was outside of the classroom in your case that 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 needed something from them in this case here it could be a, 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 a you, you set up a play pretend third party um, yeah I don't know if they answered the question, but I got to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, but it, it did. Uh, um, I have another question also about the, that also relates to the research paper in the MOOC uh, about how SSI is, is effective, and you also show that the these methods um, have, have high results in relation to traditional methods, the, the passive learning. Um, so we can see that students learn more, but seemingly since the teaching method is so different would you also say that they learn other things is, is, the, is the learning qualitatively different not only that they learn more but they also learn other things so that is some of the uh, uh, in before we um, we actually got some good results saying that that uh, 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 approaches like inquiry based learning actually work when you when you do it in in the way they were thought um, before that there were some studies saying, well, at least the students they're not they're not performing worse when we do this than 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 if we, uh, when we when we do something else, and and then these studies could also show that yes, indeed, the students l did learn something else. They also they in addition to being able to to go take tests, they also um, learn to be more maybe let's say whole people and be uh, and, and take action and 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 become. Uh, enlightened citizens in 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 our societies, um, or take steps towards that. It's not that if you have one lesson about mass based, that then your students will 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 uh, certainly be uh, uh, well equipped citizens for for anything. But but it, it's a step on the way, giving them the the room to make decisions and argue, and then also take the consequences of those those decisions. In fact, that is also I think what what science is about. That you make a hypothesis you make some decisions on how to test that and then you take the consequences yeah exactly and um, and the consequences is also in a societal uh, environment so so uh, there are also ethics involved and uh, and other values than just pure science uh, so I, I'm, I'm 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 sort of seeing that you 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 would produce sort of uh critical citizenship also uh in addition to just knowing the science you can see how what the world science play in, in the society um, I, yeah in, in uh, from uh, i've been working a lot with the, the with the concept of competence and in my understanding of that that is exactly it so it's not enough to have knowledge and to have procedural skills you have to be able to use them for something but the other way around you cannot you cannot use knowledge that you don't have so you also need the yeah. knowledge you need the procedural knowledge to to be able to do stuff so it's not, and that's where sometimes sometimes I think uh, 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 new teaching formats can maybe uh, um, uh, squander that uh, that notion of, of 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 what what it can do because we have to also you know this is we also have to check that the students actually have the knowledge they, that we think they have and can and then can use it. Yes, of course. Uh, a third and final question uh, about this anxiety. And um, in a traditional classroom, you can sort of hide as a student by not raising your hand and, and you're safe. But have you seen students using strategies? Because I think I've seen that uh, in projects like this when they sort of mentally opt out. Is that something that you can see as a teacher and, and act? Or how would you act? How would you detect it? Is this a problem? I think, I think it's really hard. Um... Because what we see, and and I showed you a little bit of of insight from Mars Base, but sometimes we see the students again going even more roundabout. So it seems like they're off task, and then suddenly they have a they, they come up with a solution. So I think I mean, uh, um, I, I I teach at university, and and even there it's hard. I think it's much harder uh, for you guys out there. <laughs> uh, so so in a sense, uh, um, it. So I, I think it's very, very difficult. Um, but in the end, I think, I mean, maybe talking to your students saying, how was this? Was it was it OK? Uh, uh, could could what could we do differently? Um, yeah. That might also uh, be a good idea. 
Thanks right. a lot for your presentation and also for, for the very interesting discussion. The chat has been very active in the meantime. Uh, yeah. Many teachers agree with the fact that students don't raise their hand also out of uh, fear, more of the reaction of the classmate ra rather than the teacher. Uh, so, uh, well, there were some suggestions also. How can we um, uh, solve this problem? Uh, someone said I use post-its when I ask my students to brainstorm. So in that way they can write, they don't have to be raising their hand. Another one was working in small groups makes it uh, easier to intervene without fear because students open up and express their thoughts and knowledge. And uh, another interesting uh, one was that um, it's uh, an interesting method and it reminds them of the Socratic method, learning through conversations. So coming up with uh, many things, especially also um, talking about social anxiety by placing them in a fictional setting sounds very interesting. So I think many teachers are going to try to use narrative scenario from, from now on. So yeah, see. <laughs> great reactions. Now, um, again, I would like to thank you both, uh, Christian and Jasper, for your presentations and also for the very interesting exchanges. And now it's your moment. If you are behind the screen and you want to ask anything else to our speakers, please write uh, in the chat and we will address the questions. We have around 15 minutes left, uh, so we can for sure uh, address many of them. We also got questions in advance from the MOOC, so perhaps uh, while you are typing your first questions, we can start with uh, the ones we got from the MOOC. For example, could we teach the topic of particle accelerators using the socio-scientific teaching method? Christian, you explained a little bit about it before, but uh, could you give perhaps some uh, examples here? Yeah, those are just early ideas, but I mean, you, you you sort of need to find an issue, something that matters to society uh, or, or to people. And um, yeah, Jesper also mentioned that we, we, we can use these facilities to find out important uh, results. So so in the in the scientist stories, there is one story about. I don't know if you have seen that yet, but it will be in the MOOC in, in, in some modules where scientists looking at how to store hydrogen in a very compact way, because you have this challenge that we need to 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 be careful about emissions of carbon dioxide. And one solution could be to use other fuels instead by instead than diesel and gasoline. Uh, and hydrogen have been suggested as something that you can use in cars, but there is an issue with hydrogen being a gas and takes up a lot of volume. So there are material scientists looking at how can we store hydrogen uh, more compactly in liquid form. So that could potentially solve a lot of issues uh, related to, to, to the climate. Um, but it's done, that, that research is being done in a particle accelerator. So it's possible to look at what kind of research uh, what functions do particle accelerators have in the society and look at what might the issues be here? What is at stake and, and, and start exploring that? I think it's possible. I, I don't have any ready answers. Many times I think that the uh, social scientific issues, they, they it's sort of like we have a problem. We have to solve this problem. What is the best, best method and is it ethical? And then on to the next problem, right? So it, 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 there is a kind of a start. Maybe you, we could also say, why, why is it that we, we spend a lot of money on CERN? And, and why do we spend money on fi figuring out that there is a, a, Higgs, a Higgs particle? Um, you, could, you could have some discussions about that uh, and maybe say, well, it, it has to do with, with our understanding of ourselves. And that's OK. It's actually OK that we spend some money on this and then we know that CERN has has brought a lot of, of nice, nice things, and we will also get that from the uh, accelerator uh, uh, people uh, uh, everywhere else. So, so it's it, it's not because uh, there's not nothing else, but I think that discussion about who are we in the universe and, and what is the universe, that's actually, and okay, I don't know if it falls into social scientific issues, but it is sort of, you know, the, one of these grand questions, and I think that's okay. Great, thanks a lot. Um, another question this time from the chat is, where can I learn about inquiry-based learning? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might see a little bit of this in the course, right? Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, 
Uh, so I, it depends on where you are. If you are in, uh, uh, in 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 Denmark or the Nordic countries, I mean, you can do it at university. Uh, there are numerous uh, in-service teacher programs uh, that 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 does that. So I don't know where the question comes from, um, but usually teacher teacher uh, uh, training institutions will have inquiry-based learning uh, courses. Um, so, so that's my. I mean, not knowing where the question came from, that's my that's my best guess. Um, I'm guessing that the question might come from Spain, uh, but if some if someone wants to clarify, uh, but yes, indeed, I think if you look at first uh, what ministries of education are putting out there, there's a lot of uh, resources. Also, for example, uh, this course is um, co-branded by Scientix, the community for uh, science education uh, in Europe. So over there, you also have many uh, opportunities to learn about this great approach. Now, um, another question from the chat this time. Do you think that it's possible to organize uh, in such a way with respect to uh, available time? With, because we know that uh, the curriculum sometimes is demanding and teachers do not have this time. So in Greece, there is a time race for us teachers to cover the science uh, curriculum topics. How do you feel about this? Yeah, I, I was. I mean, I've been working with inquiry-based education in, in various also EU projects, and I know it's not only Greece; it's everywhere. That yeah. if you ask teachers, I mean, what is the main obstacle for you trying out new stuff? It's it's time. Um, uh, you are very pressed for time, and that I can almost say that exclusively. I mean, that's that's that goes for everywhere in the world. My my approach would be. Try, try out small, take one lesson where you you say, OK, here I'll try it and then then try that out. And see if, if, if you if you can make it work and then maybe the first time, the first year you try it, it doesn't work as well. OK, now you try it next year or, or if you have two classes that, the, that are comparable and then you try it again and then you you sort of try to reflect and say what actually worked here and what did not work. Um, if you do that, I mean, you will spend time. I mean, I, I won't lie. You you have to spend time. <laughs> so so whatever you have, so so dedicated and say, okay, I'll try this thing here where I'll, I'll I'll try to switch it around. So so I give them some questions because you, it's also something you have to learn as a teacher uh, to do that. Um, so my 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 advice would be start small. Uh, in addition to that, there is another thing you can do uh, if you if you collaborate with other teachers and do transdisciplinary work, you might find that, OK, maybe we can do two things at the same time here. So if you if, if you have a social and uh, scientific issue and you write the report in English, if that is the second language of the students, it could be both chemistry and English and, and it, it will sort of serve two uh, subjects at the same time. So that would save some time. In, There's in like a, several subjects. Very good point, and it goes perfectly with the next question. Uh, so many teachers are already exploring uh, race to space, and they are wondering how can we integrate it in different subjects, for example, in math, history, social studies, also in different languages, or even English as a second language. So how can we do this? <laughs> it's related to Christian what you were saying here. <laughs> so we have the the. Um, the way we've we've designed it, it it is a a uh, it is in English, and we 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 do not have the resources to 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 resources to translate it into all, all the other languages. So so that's something that 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 might need to uh, that where you need to make some translations, or it has to be part made of of some English. Um, the, so in 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 it it depends on on sort of the freedom you have in the curriculum. So um, in maths, for example, there are some things where they have to to do some mathematics manipulations. So that's that could be be part of it. There are also some some places where they need to um, uh, where they need to to read off graphs and 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 understand graphs. So that's also part of it. In terms of particular content, um, uh, if you if your curriculum has something about uh, uh, Bragg's law uh, for for diffraction. I know that there's a lot of people who do diffraction grading experiments with a with a laser and then some kind of uh, 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 grading. Some of it is actually relatable to that, so it could be an expansion of that. You, if if you have already taught that, you can build on this with with uh, with some of it. Um, if there's a lot about energy and 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 waves, 
in there as well. So you could relate it to some part of it. But of course, if you have a very set curriculum, again, I, I, I don't know exactly what your what your curricula are out there, but you have a very set curriculum, it, it will be a challenge. But but there's some things in there that that should be uh, uh, possible. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we are talking a lot about how to bring it, and I think sometimes we are focusing more on uh, upper primary, secondary, or even you know even older students. But we also had questions in the MOOC of how can I bring uh, so uh, um, so uh, socio scientific issues to early childhood education or to lower primary or even okay these particle accelerators? How can I bring that? to my younger students? How can I make it um, in a way that it's simple for them to understand and they will also be uh, motivated? And if you have any examples of this. I, this is beyond my research. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, it, uh, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, I would, I would hesitate to, to talk about it because it is different uh, in early childhood uh, uh, and, and, and those smaller uh, classes. Um, so. I will not say that it cannot be done, but it would need to be uh, we would need to rethink it quite a lot, I think, based on what I know and, and the, 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 the little research I've done on the subject. Um, so it's I know for certain that inquiry based education or science methods are possible at that level. Um, but when it if it's accelerator physics and, and particularly the way that we have done it, uh, uh, in, in right now in the MOOC, I don't. I would hesitate to 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 just say you can use it everywhere. I think we might have some part of the MOOC that um, might answer to this partly. Um, so so in, in so, sometimes we we simplify things when, when we teach because we can't bring all the complexities of quantum physics uh, in, in, in the, into the classroom. So so one thing that you can do with smaller children is, is to investigate how you can shoot marbles at different shapes and see how they bounce back. And that you can use as a, as a, as a sort of a model to explain wha, what the ESS facility is, is about. Because if you shoot particles at other things, you will see that they will bounce back in different ways depending on the shape of those things. So, so you can sort of see that you can explore with small children and they can guess what is the shape when we see that the marbles are bouncing back in this way in, instead of this way. And you can you can sort of build an understanding of what what how can you use a particle accelerator as sort of as a microscope. There's one thing I would say to that. Um, so I think that's a good model for maybe for that. But then I would I would like to say, OK, so so we know that when 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 neutrons, for instance, they interact with a sample, it it depends on their wave nature. So so this idea that 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 things that are material can actually go into the small, small uh, uh, parts of the world, <laughs> they, they they behave like waves. I don't know if that's possible to but but the, the things that we do in early childhood that sort of they, they bring that with them. So so if, if that is becomes a, a strong conception, then it may be recognized as a misconception later on because now, oh, it's the ball model. Yeah, we all know that's wrong or something like that, right? Uh, um, so so uh, I think we might, one, should, one needs to be careful, but but I, I mean, uh, it, it, it's a start. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, and they have all the curiosity in the world, so we can take advantage of it. Um, we've got two minutes left, so let me try to see if we can squeeze one more question for both of you. Do you think, and uh, this question is coming from the MOOC, do you think all students should be rewarded when doing experiments or role play activities? How do you see this? Should they be rewarded? Yes, exactly. I don't know uh, in, in which sense, if they can get a certificate or I don't know. Um, yeah, any kind of reward when they are doing this kind of uh, approaches. I, I so we know actually from from studies that any external reward will diminish motivation. Which is a little bit sad because our whole school system is based on external rewards, namely grades and marking. But that is one of the strongest results, and it's long, one of the long, longest lasting results that I have seen in education, that external motivation in general um, removes motivation. And it removes it particularly if they have an intrinsic motivation, something that they really like, you can remove that with rewards. 
and so that's another lecture. It, it takes an hour, but but <laughs> but that's the point. So I would be very hesitant to give rewards. You could, I mean, you could maybe make it a, a sort of like a cozy setting where now we're doing role play. Now we have cake if you like cake, right? But 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 if you reward the, the single students for being part of it, you you could end up with a counter uh, result uh, like that. So I would be hesitant to do that. I agree. Another interpretation of the question might be whether or not it would be rewarding for all students, like if they would appreciate it or not. But that also relates to, to what you have been talking about, Jesper, that uh, actually there is a challenge in getting them involved from, from the start that they might appreciate more the passive learning. Uh, however, in my experience, when you were you know, when you were able to get them to opt in and start working, it might be very rewarding for them uh, when they see that okay, we're actually learning with this method, and we, we we're learning things that are unique knowledge uh, and useful knowledge, and that can actually uh, be rele relevant for solving an issue, a real issue. One, and this is anecdata but what I am I'm hearing people uh, in, in in Denmark uh, about uh, some 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 school teachers who are using uh, the base on Mars the one I presented uh, before and some of them say well my students hated it uh, I don't want to do this again but and that's the whole almost the whole class but then they come back and they say oh these students they loved it they say it's the most rewarding way of, of, of working so it i think it's very dependent on the classroom and, and and how the students are engaging with each other before you do it um that's why i'm saying you you need to read your classroom sometimes you have to sort of say okay i'll, I'll take the sour apple and then i'll uh, um I'll, I'll teach uh, uh, uh like they prefer um because otherwise they might not want to do anything and then it's it's all in vain anyways, right? Absolutely. You need to know your students and uh, the teachers, they know best how to do this. Um, so thanks a lot uh, for the very interesting conversations and thank you everyone who joined us. As mentioned earlier, you will have access to the recording of this webinar and to the slides uh, and also the links that we share. Uh, everything will be in the course. Don't miss our next webinar about the unexpected applications of accelerators. You can find more information in the live section uh, on the course and also uh, here in the chat. Thanks a lot also, Jesper and Christian, for your time. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.